thousand members of their very large organization larry press executive director he has been for twenty years now he's written one book and edited another one he wrote arm people victorious that was published in nineteen ninety and edited a second book published in nineteen ninety five entitled safeguarding liberty the constitution and citizen militias he's held beyond just being a the executive director of a very powerful and influential pro gun organization he's also held elective office not many people probably outside of virginia know this but he held elective office in the state of virginia serving in the house of delegates he directs as well as gun owners of america his interests are not just solely in guns he's also into other uh, public interest organizations he serves as the vice chairman of the american institute for cancer research so larry's a very very busy guy he is nationally known he is extremely well known and extremely educated on the firearms issue and he's well versed and well spoken and i can't think of anybody better to have with us today to address CCW reform on a national basis than Larry Pratt. We're proud to have him here. Would you join me in welcoming, ladies and gentlemen, the Executive Director of Gun Owners of America, Mr. Larry Pratt. I sure appreciate the opportunity to be here, and I'm really gratified that so many of you are here on such a beautiful day. Obviously, you are dedicated to be inside when we really all ought to be outside today. I would like to take a look at, at the whole idea of having a strategy for victory. I think for so long, generally speaking, we in the freedom, pro-freedom movement and the Second Amendment community in particular, have had a strategy for playing defense only and that strategy ultimately is only going to produce defeat. So we need to assess uh, what it takes to put together a strategy for victory and I'd like to try to make a contribution to that. First of all I think it would be helpful if we were clear in mind what is it that we seek. Do we want to just have a little bit of an improvement over the present situation? Uh, or do we want to see a restoration of constitutional government in this country? And I think we have to uh, at least hopefully start with the idea that we do have a constitution. I know not everybody is in our country is completely clear of that. I doubt that there's any confusion here. But I was talking with a teacher of a private school this week. And he told me that he had just taken a class of high school students, new to the school, 17 of them. They had come from the public school, and four of them were honor students. And he was able to get them all uh, to answer correctly as to who George Washington was. They had that. But they didn't know when the Declaration of Independence was signed. Only two of them knew two of the Bill of Rights. The rest didn't know any. Um, they didn't know against whom we had fought in World War II. Uh, only two of them, with a little prompting, could figure out that it was Iraq that we fought uh, over in the Gulf War. Um, but the most critical thing, it would seem to me, if we don't know what our freedoms are, that we're supposed to have them, and what it means to have them, and how they're to be used and why they're important, there's really, it's all over. Uh, we might as well just uh, stick our hands out and have the shackles put on. And I think some of the folks in Washington would probably like to have us do that. Now, I think we need to be clear in our own mind about what our Constitution does mean and what kind of a government that was being set up. Because if we don't have that in mind, then we don't really know what direction that we need to move toward for a strategy for victory. When we're talking about a strategy for victory, I think we need to be clear that there, our government has been set up, and nobody's changed it legally. 
I know it's been changed a lot in practice. The law is, the Constitution is more ignored in the breach than it is in observation. But still, it is the law of the land, and those who don't uphold their oath of office are doing just that. They're not upholding their oath of office. And there's a number of words that we could use for people like that, but we'll not get into that right now. But the basic issue, it seems to me, is that that form of government, that Republican form of government that was set up, is one of very limited powers that we granted to the government. And you see, it seems to me, and I sure get a nose full of it in Washington all the time, and I don't think it's very different here in Lansing or in other government centers around our country. The idea increasingly is that somehow the government has rights, and you and I have only one right, and that is to do what they say. It's just the opposite of the way our government actually is still on paper. It's still there. They can only do what has been explicitly delegated to them. That's the whole idea of the Tenth Amendment. They didn't think Article I, Section 6 of the U.S. Constitution was clear enough. The Anti-Federalists were very concerned that it be tied down even further than those 18 delegated powers that were listed. The Federalists, frankly, it turns out, were a bit naive, if not well-intentioned, certainly, but uh, they thought that, well, that was enough. I mean, my goodness, who, who would have any confusion about that? Well, they didn't have the ability to see 150, 200 years further beyond, but there's been plenty of confusion, willful or not, regarding that whole concept. And the Tenth Amendment, happily, is quite clear that if it's not something that's been delegated expressly to the federal government, uh, then it's retained by the states and the people. Now, that used to be kind of a joke in law schools. Students were told that if they wanted a losing defense, then raise the Tenth Am Amendment sometime, because that meant nothing. Well. You know, legal service uh, public defenders aren't always the, 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 the nothing people that they're sometimes depicted. And a fellow down in San Antonio took a case for a high school punk called Lopez, who had sold a gun on a school and thus violated a federal law that said you can't have a gun within a thousand feet of a school's boundary. And the case went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court did something that I frankly didn't think I would see in my lifetime. They rediscovered the Tenth Amendment. And they did something very significant when they did that because they, in articulating the Tenth Amendment and saying that it applied to the school zone gun ban, were saying, in effect, that all of the justification for all of the federal gun laws and really for all of the massive intervention that we have suffered from our federal government, particularly since Roosevelt, but actually going back a good hundred years probably before that. But in any case, the Commerce Clause since Roosevelt, in Article I, Section 6, ironically in a list of delegated powers of this only may you do, that Commerce Clause has been the justification for a totalitarian view of government, that anything, anything in the United States can be regulated by the federal government. It came out of a case from 1942 that went to the Supreme Court when a farmer had the audacity to think that he could grow wheat on his own land and consume it entirely on his own property, and that that wasn't the government's business. Silly boy. The government argued, and the court bought the argument, that why that had a negative impact on interstate commerce because you didn't enter the market. And based on that, the government has been simply, the only thing that's held them back is our opinion, but once we aren't looking, they move in quickly using that as their justification. Well, happily, uh, under this court, particularly under the leadership of Justices Thomas and Scalia, uh, there's been a rearticulation, a rediscovery uh, of our lost rights. Madison was so clear about it. In one of the Federalist Papers, he talked about 
the government that we have created has few powers and they are limited and we've left all the rest of the states. It doesn't get too much plainer than that. That's just a, a rephrase of the Tenth Amendment. These guys weren't hiding their rationale under a basket. And yet when I came out here and debated uh, not too far from here before a three-judge panel in a mock court, the judges at the end said, well, we're bound to uphold the rulings of the Supreme Court. That's odd. I didn't think that was in their oath of office. I thought they were bound to uphold the Constitution. <laughs> you know, silly me. You know, I just, I'm not with it. Uh, That, anyway, seems to me what we need to be after, the restoration of a constitutional, limited government where they do what we say, and if they want to tell us what to do, we remind them of their proper place. If they want to leave the government and go back and join us as, as producers, then they're welcome to tell us what their opinion is, too. But frankly, I'm not interested in their opinion unless I ask them, and I usually don't have a mind to ask them what their opinion is, uh, I hear entirely too much, uh, certainly where I come from. I don't want to hear any more from them. I want to hear only from them yes to the Constitution and no to all these other excesses, which are frankly illegitimate, without authority, and if you really pushed, I guess you'd have to say criminal. Some want to even go further. Patrick Henry uh, raised the T word backed away from it, sort of, and said, well, if this be treason, let them learn from history. And indeed, let them learn from history. It would be a neat thing to be teaching that again in school. Imagine honor students not even knowing when the Declaration of Independence was signed uh, or what are in our Bill of Rights. That used to be a requirement in many, many of the public schools just to get out of high school. Had to pass a test where you could at least summarize, list, uh, the ten, first ten amendments to our Constitution. Our present condition, uh, I think it helps to be clear about that and, and to put it up against the model of the Constitution and the light that it can shine on the, the mess that we're in now. I suppose all I would have to do to discuss this idea of our present situation would be to read the Declaration of Independence. If you've ever read through that, it's a list of government abuses and excesses, and it sounds amazingly contemporary. You know that part about you have sent, it's addressed to the king, although they knew it was really the parliament that was uh, sticking it to him, but anyway, you have s sent upon the land a host of, of uh, government officials to eat out our sustenance. Well, when they are taking about 50% of what you and I are making, or trying to make, I would say that's eating out sustenance, and that's a whole lot more than they were belly aching about. It was nowhere near. F they were worried, frankly, that if they didn't get control of the crown and reestablish the exercise of their rights as Englishmen, why those rascals in London might push it to even five percent taxation level. <laughs> I'm not sure what to think of us when we're not even really serious about pushing them back at 50 percent or wherever we are uh, today, uh, but we're certainly paying for a system that is increasingly oppressive. Maybe some of you have seen a recent article by Joseph Farah of the Western Journalism Center which went into a little detail about the growth of the federal police establishment didn't go into, well, actually, without saying it, he described the militarization of the federal police. Now, I think it's important to remember that as late as 1934, an assistant attorney general for Roosevelt, Mr. Keenan, went up to the Hill and testified and said, the federal government has no police power. That's a direct quote. Imagine a representative of one of the greatest socialists in our country read the Constitution as late as 1934 to say that the Federal Bureau of Investigation should be nothing more than a Bureau of Investigation. What are they now? I would say that the Federal Bureau of Investigation has become one of the main reasons for the corruption of law enforcement in this country because their idea of law enforcement 
is military. They are secret. They don't wear their badges like Officer O'Malley used to on when he was the cop on the beat. They don't wear their name. They don't even usually put FBI when they're doing their SWAT raids. And SWAT raids are really euphemism for paramilitary operations. And let's get it straight. A military operation is designed to do one thing, at least if it's done competently, and that's to hit and wipe out the target as quickly as possible. That's not what police work's all about. You know, if they think you've got a paperwork error, they send the EPA SWAT team on you now. There's no idea of sending an auditor. You know, FEMA has Federal Emergency Management uh, Administration has a SWAT team. They gave some money, which they had no business giving anyway, but they gave some money to Clearwater County, Idaho, where Orofino is located. It's the hometown of Congressman Helen Chenoweth. They hit the county offices with a SWAT raid and took their computers and all their records because they didn't think the money that was being used for flood relief was being administered the way they would like. And so they hit them with a paramilitary operation. There's something fundamentally wrong with that attitude that they don't send a real cop, they don't send an investigator or an auditor or something like that, but they send a military operation. Something very, very wrong. That, by the way, think about it, (laughs) is exactly the situation that we had to deal with under King George III. We didn't have police. It was all military. And these guys then, just like military today, don't really know how to spell search warrant. It's not in their vocabulary. (laughs) Search and and seize, uh, search and destroy, those are the words. But search warrant, that doesn't compute in the military mind, nor should it. I'm not criticizing the military. I'm criticizing cops who can't make the distinction. I'm certainly not criticizing all cops. Thank God there's still many thousands uh, represented by, uh, so ably by a guy like uh, Jim Fotis of the Law Enforcement Association of America who still believe in the Constitution and understand what police work is supposed to be all about. But they are running against a real tough trend because what's the first thing that happens when we elect a sheriff? Elect a sheriff. The law says in most states he's got to go to, to Washington, actually to Quantico, Virginia, And he's got to learn how to be a real cop by studying under the FBI. Well, what do they teach him? Oh, you know, water cannons, armored personnel vehicles, uh, fully automatic, large caliber, heavy caliber weaponry, uh, SWAT raids, military tactics. That's the idea. And that's how a lot of this corruption is occurring. And then instead of sheriffs exercising their proper authority and telling these lawmen, at least in the states that haven't yet made federal agents into state law enforcement agents, giving them arrest powers as if they worked for the state or the the county, sheriffs uh, are rolling over and not uh, not saying, well, wait a minute, let me review what you're doing. You're here as my guest because I'm the chief law enforcement officer in this jurisdiction. And even if they can say that, they're not exercising that authority because they've been buddified uh, they're all buddies now uh, with the guys there in Quantico. When King George wanted to, uh, say, inspect the, uh, the goods that were being imported by John Hancock, he was the guy, you know, that put his name real big on the Declaration of Independence. Uh, we still say, put your John Hancock here. Well, he was a smuggler of Madeira wine. He was smuggling because the British were trying to strangle American commerce. He was doing an honorable thing, but of course the Crown didn't think so. And they used that, his activity and other people like him as an excuse to just invade people's homes without warrant. You know, we're getting the same thing today. Until a lawsuit was successful, the President of the United States had been sending teams to go door to door, go into people's homes in center city areas looking for drugs and guns. Isn't it interesting that the law enforcement assignments that have come from Washington have been in terms of war. 
even when they weren't law enforcement, it's been war on poverty, war on drugs, war on this, war on that. Those words are not accidental because they invoke powers behind those words. They at least invoke things in our mind. And we, oh, well, we're at war, so we you know, have to have uh, special measures and we have to look at things differently. We're not at war. Maybe some of the guys in our government are at war with us, but you know nobody's declared a war. We're not fighting Japan. They're not fighting us. I'm not sure why we're in Bosnia either. I didn't hear the declaration of war uh, to go, or I didn't see any missiles coming from Bosnia. Another aspect of the problem is that we haven't, I don't think, been diligent enough in who we send to Washington and so we have a Republican leadership that in 1994's election said that they understood the problem, that the government had grown too much, needed to be brought back under control, and send them, and they would take a big bucket and some soap and clean the place up. Well, they might have taken buckets, but I don't think it was soap water in there. It was something else. And Newt Gingrich and Trent Lott and the leadership around them have simply surrendered and gone over to the other side. It's that bad in Washington. If anything positive happens, it's because some of the feistier members among the conservatives do things anyway. When the House voted to repeal the ban on semi-automatic firearms in 1996 that had been passed into law in 1994, it was because Steve Stockman did it over the, if you will, the political dead body of Newt Gingrich, the man who had uh, said that, well, actually it was Dick Armey that had told me personally that there would be a vote. They weren't going to have a vote. That just simply wasn't true. They were going to stonewall it. They don't want to vote. And I'm not sure I understand why, because it was the firearms issue. Even the president has said repeatedly, publicly, in writing, that it was the firearms vote that cost his party control of the Congress. So what is the one vote that they don't want to have? A vote on guns. They've gone over to the other side. They think like statists, like liberal Democrats, uh, whatever is pleasing to the Washington Post and the Dan Rather. Now, some of the problem, unhappily, I think we have to look at ourselves in the mirror because it's not just them. Somebody voted for them, and somebody sent them off to Washington and maybe didn't keep close enough tabs on them in Washington, or even rewarded them when they did things that they should have been spanked for. There's two fundamental approaches to how we handle the problem, it seems to me, uh, and it helps once again, if we think that we are fighting for liberty, this is not a recreation, then a no compromise approach strikes me as um, not only advantageous, but the only one that makes any sense. But there is a second view, and it's one that has been kind of deeply rooted, uh, because this is the one that the politicians encourage themselves. And if you deal with politicians at all, and I've been one, so I can say this, the first response that you will probably get if you come in and you want something done that might be a little controversial, that won't be rewarded by the hometown pro-big government newspaper, you'll get some kind of um, very uh, pleasant seduction, or at least offer to seduce. Uh, you'll be, uh, uh, if you keep persisting, uh, you'll be told, well, this is not the time. We'll, we'll do what we can, but this is not the time. Um, oh, yeah, that's asking too much. Uh, maybe maybe uh, next year something a little bit smaller. Uh, we, might, we might try to do that, but this is not the time. And if you continue to press, you very soon may find an angry reaction. And some people think, oh, my goodness, I've gone too far. Better back off. And when actually it's just the opposite. The politician has already long gone too far. And if he's getting angry, it's because he doesn't want to back off, and he's perceiving that he may have to. And in candid moments, I've had politicians tell me that. Don't stop 
putting on the pressure when you hear complaints. It means that finally you're getting through. And if you stop, all it means is they think, oh, phew, uh, I guess I got that problem taken care of. Um, so we can be our own worst enemies, but if we look at the political process as one in which we're going to, to fundamentally try to have access rather than require conf conformance to an upholding of the oath of office, then if we're just looking for access, here's what happens. First of all, whether we say it or not, whether we even think it or not, the actual assumption, which may be quite implicit, is that, well, we're going to lose. That's why we've got to play defense. We just, you know, if we can just have access, uh, we can work out a few arrangements, and uh, the thing won't be quite as bad as it otherwise would have been. It certainly is a lot more sensible than just standing there and saying, no, that's silly. You know, we can't do that. We just got to have access. And so those that are intent on having access, in order to maintain access, when a politician votes incorrectly, many times you find what happens is the vote's not tallied. It's overlooked. When Larry Craig and Ted Stevens, the senators from Idaho and Alaska who are NRA board members, voted to ban semi-automatic firearms in 1993, the vote was not held against them by their board. Now, how do you bring up children? When they want to do something that's wrong, do you just say, oh, well, you'll learn someday? I don't think so, because you know what you get if you do that? You get a spoiled brat. And of course, to get back to the analogy about the angry politician, what you find is when you finally step in and you try to draw the line and say, you've got to take your nap. You've got to obey your parents. Well, you may be faced with a temper tantrum. And if the temper tantrum intimidates you, then the temper tantrum was successful. And the spoiled behavior continues, just at a noisier level. It's just been escalated, that's all. And then we blinked. Our view is that we are not going to move forward until we are committed to holding them accountable as much as possible, trying to get recorded votes uh, on amendments if it need be, um, because often the leadership is going to try to bottle up uh, the legislation itself. But there are ways that uh, in almost every legislative body, whether it's through a discharge procedure or through putting something on as an amendment, that we can get recorded votes. Now, that's a very unpopular thing to do within a body. Having been there, I can, I can assure you that it's uncolleagueably behavior because everybody knows that a recorded vote means accountability. It means that you and I back home, you know, the boobs, well, maybe we won't be as much of a boob anymore because we can see in black and white what was done. We don't have to just take on their representation what they did because, you know, they might have been confused about what they did or they might just be lying. But if there's a vote, there's a vote in writing. And that's, that's so critical. We need people, one or two at least, in a legislative body to force the votes. And then it's up to us then to take that very valuable commodity that's been given to us and make the best of it by holding them accountable. Now, it's not necessary, I would submit, to try to have the resources to deal with every single one of these miscreants, but we don't have to. It's a good thing we don't have to have those resources because none of us are ever going to have those kind of resources. Farmers deal with a, a problem uh, sometimes with crows, and they've told me that uh, they don't have to take their rifle out and shoot every crow to keep the crows away from the barn or whatever it is. All they really need to do is shoot one or two and hang the carcass up on the barn, and the rest stay away. Well, we have found the same thing works in politics. And if you put a few, one or two political carcasses, I mean, they're going to decay and fall away after a while, and you have to repeat the process. But, you know, it means you only have to go after targeted opportunities. It's not something where we have to solve every problem. You know, we can't, we don't have the resources to solve everything, so why bother, you know, just drop out because it's hopeless. It's not hopeless at all. It's quite doable. And in those states where we've uh, conducted some legislative battles, we have found that it can be done. Uh, now, one of the things that's been so helpful, and particularly in the, 
what we're talking about here in concealed carry, first of all, let's be clear, we're talking about a right that only exists, that's only exercised in any purity in about one and a half states of our country, Vermont and, and the non-urban areas of Montana, which is to say most of the state. Um, in those areas, in those jurisdictions, no one needs a permit to carry a concealed firearm. No one needs a license. No one gets a background check. It's not the government's business. It's actually not their business. It is a constitutional right, after all. It's protected by the Constitution. It wasn't created by the Constitution. It was created by God. But in any case, the, the matter is this works. Freedom works. The state that has the lowest murder rate in the country almost every year is Vermont. And Montana is not too far behind. No doubt if they allow the same freedom in the cities that they allow in the non-urban areas, they would be in competition with Vermont more effectively. There's almost a direct correlation, and you may have already heard it discussed, between the ability to carry a concealed firearm and the murder rates. The more people that have guns, the, the lower the murder rates, the lower the violent crime rates. And uh, that was the result of a massive study that was done uh, by a couple of scholars at the University of Chicago, 15 years of all the crime data from all of the country. It is a real major body blow uh, to the notion that the gun controllers have that if we just have fewer guns that we will somehow uh, live in a sweet society. Guns don't change the nature of people. Now, another problem that's related to this, and, and we're, we're really working against ourselves in this area, is that we've been so eager to have ways of, of stopping the other side without just saying no, that we've gotten too clever by half. In the area of the Brady Law, a lot of people in the Second Amendment community in order to stop the waiting period, which is unconstitutional, it's obnoxious, it's wrong, and it should be undone, but it is sunset. It's gone in 98. No more federally imposed unconstitutional waiting period, uh, at least coming from Washington. But we ourselves have been demanding that we have an instant background check. Do you know what they do with that instant background check? They're creating a central, federal, computerized registry of who the gun owners are. That's not something I'm making up. That's not an allegation. That is what they are doing. They've done it for years. Every, even when the police were just checking guns for crime uh, purposes, which never solve, hardly ever solve any crime, uh, they always kept a, wreck of what, a record of what kind of check they were doing. And so they didn't change the procedure. Now they just, we found out from the fights we've been in, in in Ohio and in Georgia that when that federal computer is contacted, they keep the name, the social security number, and a code that indicates that it was a Brady background check. No rocket scientist need tell them that that's a gun owner because you've already bought the gun at the point of the background check, right? You've filled out all the paperwork, you've given them your card, everything. We are, convert, we are demanding when we go push for an instant background check that we convert a right into a privilege. We're never going to see effective concealed carry if we keep pushing the instant background check. Why? If you have to have a background check just to own a gun, why surely we ought to do more than that if you're going to carry it because you might shoot somebody. Doggone right we might shoot somebody, like a crook when there's no cop around. I should hope so. That's the whole idea. <laughs> Let me mention one other area that I think is very important if we're going to retake lost ground. I don't think we're going to take it back on just our own terms. Again, a look at history can be very helpful for us and encouraging, actually. In broad terms, what we were looking at 
at the time of our war for independence was a second English civil war, something that had been going on for 130 years. In fact, the irony is that the George Washington family and others of that uh, Virginia aristocracy and so forth were refugees from Cromwell's Puritan government, even as the folks in Massachusetts were refugees from the counter-reaction uh, of the royal governments that were persecuting the Puritans. And yet both had come together 130 years later, and all of them had become Whigs. Now, I didn't really understand what a Whig was, even when they had the word in my textbooks when I was in school, and that was quite a while ago. But basically, the Whig was the fellow who took the ideas of the Scottish Reformation, which hammered out the idea from especially Romans 13 that talks about the role of government in the Bible. And the role of government is real simple and real limited. As, as it says in, in the first verses of that chapter, the magistrate is to be a servant for your good. Imagine, a servant. <laughs> That's an unusual idea these days, I realize. And for your good, and of course the Bible does talk a little bit about what is good and what is bad. So, you know, it gives you a few clues as to what the government is supposed to do and what its limits are. And the result of that entered the English, the British political system as the Whig political philosophy that at root had a real simple idea. Lex Rex was the name of a book written about the subject. The law is above the king. And of course the king had just the opposite idea, Rex Lex. <laughs> I am the law. When I speak, that is the law. I'm above the law. I can do whatever I want. And so for 130 years that idea was hammered on. First uh, in England and Scotland and then over here in the colonies. And finally the English decided they were going to, like dogs, go back to their vomit. And so we said, well, fine, but that's not supper for us. We're going to be Englishmen no more. And that's why we became an independent country, because we had the conviction that the law is above the government. That's why we ended up with a written constitution, just to make it a little bit easier to understand. But when our war for independence took place, it came out as, a, if you will, a flowering of a religious revival. And the people that were willing to die were willing to die because they didn't fear a king and his troops that could only take their body and murder them. What they feared was a God who could take their body and their soul. And so they were willing to fight for freedom because of that deeply held religious conviction. And I know you're not going to find this in most of the textbooks. But the battle cry in many, many of the battles of the war for independence was no king but King Jesus, the law above the king. Isn't that interesting? Maybe that's why our history has been so truncated and so many of these key ideas have been separated from us so that we don't even understand where our liberties come from, that they really do come from God, not from the government not even from the mind of man. So even if we change our mind tomorrow, those liberties and those precepts remain the same forever and forever. And that's why there can be freedom, because there is predictability in a system that is eternal. It doesn't depend on the outcome of the next election. Those are the ideas that were insisted upon, and when the king and the parliament said, no way, we're going to continue raping your women and burning your churches and invading your homes and taxing you until you're blue, well, that's when we said, no, you're not. Goodbye. Now, we can still vote, you know. Uh, we actually still, in some ways, have an easier time of it than our forefathers had, even though in many ways we're much more enslaved than they even dreamed King George, you know, if King George could look down now and see what's going on, no doubt he would be saying, I was born over 200 years too soon. 
<laughs> what the government in Washington is doing is so far in excess of what that petty tin horn dictator was doing. And we're not even aware of that. It would sure help if we did our homework so that we knew that that's where we want to go to. That's where freedom is, not through some, you know, what makes a government official so able to tell us what to do, regardless of the Constitution? I mean, you know, the guy lives right next door. He puts his pants on one leg at a time just the way we do. Why does he somehow become so omniscient when he walks into a government office? For us to believe that, for us to give credence to that, is to be like that population that was so fawning over their emperor that when he went out with no clothes, they admired his clothes and what beautiful clothes. And it took a simple little boy to say, but he has no clothes. <laughs> and then finally everybody had to kind of admit they were being pretty silly. And these government bureaucrats and these legislators and these judges, when they go outside the Constitution, they might as well, we ought to tell them, hey, you've got no clothes. You're outside your covering. You're outside the zone you belong in. But so far, we seem to be behaving just like that population that was standing there applauding as the emperor walked down the street buck naked in that celebration to exhibit his new clothes. Hopefully, we will all become Whigs once again, and we will insist that the government live as our servant, and that we will look for candidates who have that view, and if we can't find them in our particular district, that's all right. Remember, again, the, the whole idea of controlling crows. We don't have to take care of every one of those crows. Go and help a Helen Chenoweth out in Idaho or You've got some excellent legislators here in the state. Uh, and if you, even if you don't live in their districts, you ought to be helping them. Uh, make sure that they get back in so that their colleagues see that it is good politics uh, to stand for principle and to be willing to go out on the point. It's kind of hard to remember. I know it doesn't make sense, but it's kind of hard to remember when you're in a, a legislative arena hard to remember that the folks around you, the 50 or 100 colleagues or whatever in your legislative body, are not your constituents. In a certain sense they are because they may or may not uh, vote for your bills, but you're there to represent your constituents back home that voted for you, and that idea often quickly vanishes in the pressure cooker of the legislative world. So one of the things you can do is just stay in touch with your legislators. If they're doing the right thing, it, I know it's not a natural reaction or a response on our part, but you really ought to call them up and say, thanks for doing the right thing. And when they do the wrong thing, for goodness sakes, make sure you call up and tell them that was the wrong thing to do. And if you do that, uh, I can't support you. Uh, it, you know, just make it real plain so that there's this reality check because they're not going to get a reality check from their leadership. They're not going to get a reality check from the newspaper that they're reading has to come from us. And so that means vigilance, eternal vigilance. Uh, our forefathers said is the price of liberty, and I'm afraid we've got a long time to go yet before eternity has run its course. I hope that you will look for a way of getting the Vermont Concealed Carry Law introduced into this state legislature. I am not going to tell you that I think it's going to pass in the first year. I don't think it would happen, although sometimes you can be surprised. We've been involved in legislative fights when we didn't think we would do any better than get a recorded vote, and we ended up winning, which kind of made me think that we didn't ask for enough. You'll never get more than what you ask for in a political battle. So if freedom is what you want, you've got to ask for it. And that's the lesson that we've been learning and why increasingly we're encouraging legislators to go for the goal, to go for everything. Once that concealed carry law for model on Vermont has been introduced into a legislative body, guarantee you it helps to change the whole dynamics of the legislative debate. And it starts pushing things that way. The Brady Law 
as far as I can track back, and I think it goes back further than I can track, goes back at least to 1981. The Republicans had, for the first time in a long time, taken control of the Senate. Ted Kennedy had for years been introducing a thing called the Omnibus Crime Bill, which was a wildly unconstitutional piece of federal intrusion. And Strom Thurmond became the chairman of the committee, and he obligingly introduced S-1, the Omnibus Crime Bill, for his good friend, Ted Kennedy. And in that bill, he sort of tacked in a little bit of language that we now know as the Brady waiting period. So it's been around a long time. And by the way, the Republicans have been diddling with us for a long time, too. Not all of them, obviously, happily, or we'd have really been cooked. Uh, but frankly, some of the leadership needs to be sent packing. And the only way they're going to get packed is if we go pack them. And uh, that's the job, it seems to me. But we need to be asking the right questions. We need to be pushing the debate ourselves. And when we're told that, oh, well, that won't pass yet, my, my colleagues will laugh at me. They don't vote for you. I do. Introduce the doggone bill. That ought to be, in a polite version, the message that gets sent that we're tired of playing defense. We're tired of talking about how much of our arm is going to get chopped off this time. No more surgery from these non-surgeons. We're going back to take what's been lost. And so the only things that we should be talking about would be what it is we can repeal, what kind of restrictions can be overturned, what kind of politician can be singled out and targeted for defeat in the next election. That seems to me to be a discussion worthy of our time. Lord willing, uh, we will engage in that more and more as the days go by, and uh, we will see some carcasses, politically speaking, tacked up on top of some of the state houses around our country and in Washington, and then I think we'll start to be able to communicate a little bit more directly and clearly uh, with these folks. Uh, I th I'm not sure, I th I've kind of run the clock, so I think I better stop. I really appreciate uh, you all being here. Thank you very much, and uh, let's go get them.